The goal of this podcast is to help you break in and thrive in advertising. And we do that every week by sharing the stories and advice of those rocking it on the other side. We welcome you back now to Adjunct, the series where we interview the best of the best in the world of advertising educators, the people who are in the classroom making a direct difference and helping hundreds of students a year break in and thrive in marketing. This week, we talk with Doug Gold, professor of practice at the highly acclaimed Boston University. Doug is the creative guru over at BU. His portfolio classes sound tough, but insanely effective in producing award-winning student work, and the student work that looks like real work that recruiters love. And I love how Doug structures his classes. I also love his views on career search and his bullseye exercise, which he will walk you through today to ensure you find a career you love. And with over 30 years in the advertising business and numerous award-winning campaign pieces, including Can Lion winning work, and a top spot in the Super Bowl ad meter, he knows how to help you land a job. In fact, he had two students win a silver crowbar in our Q1 crowbar award show. Shout out to Stephanie Cohn and Simon Yu for their work. I know I'm tap butt on the Dasani brief judged by Greg Hahn. You can see their campaign on www.crowbarawards.com. And hey, we always have briefs live for you to work on to break into advertising, and you can do that by winning a crowbar. Give it a check. Now, on with the show. This is the Breaking and Entering Advertising Podcast Adjunct Edition. <laughs> and I am your accomplice, Gino Schellenberger. Kick it, Mikey. All right, Doug Gold, welcome to the Breaking and Entering Advertising Podcast. Thanks so much for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Gino. How are you doing? Doing well in the office right now. It's a relatively uh, relaxing day or relaxed day at Havas, Chicago. So can't complain. How about yourself? Yeah, uh, semester's over, so um, I cut a lot of tree limbs today, fed some birds. Uh, really, a uh, good good day to be a human. Uh, not 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 a lot of people get the same kind of Mondays I get after semester. <laughs> hey, I like that. Um, and if you, the people clicked on this episode, they know that you're a professor of practice at of advertising at Boston University. So, pr- professor of practice advertising at Boston University. Did I get that correct? That's correct. Yep. Amazing. And you're also a freelance creative director. Is that is that also correct? Sure. Yep. I still pick up, uh, you know, different size freelance projects. It depends on uh, what what I'm doing and uh, how much I think I can handle or want to handle. But um, mm-hmm. I still do some pretty big campaigns and then I do lots of small stuff, too. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, 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 what are you doing in the summer? Is that usually the freelance work when that picks up? How do you spend your time? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I make teaching like when I when I went to full time teaching after thirty four years agency side, I, the students are my first goal. So I'll, even though as a professor of the practice, the college wants you to stay relevant and wants you to do freelance work. My goal is to try to do that work in gaps that are comfortable. So during the semester, I try to, in order to be a good instructor. Um, I have to devote a lot of my time to getting ready for the class, teaching the class, and then office hours, et cetera, after. So I do most of my heavy freelance lifting in the summer. So if clients call me and I say, look, if you can slide this to May, I can probably help you. But if you need it in you know, November or October and it's too big a project, I, I typically turn it down. And that makes sense. And I feel like the university should respect that. And I'm, I'm sure they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. They don't have- they have no problem with that. Amazing. So they hired you to teach advertising. What type of like what type of classes are you teaching over at Boston University? So currently I teach portfolio development classes at the graduate and undergraduate level. So typically juniors and senior undergrads um, nice. and uh, graduate level portfolio development. So 
these are um, you know high level, highly interactive, uh, lifelike uh, assignments. You know whether it's young ones or DNAD awards. Uh, in your case, actually, we just had the students um, play in the Crowbar Awards. Um, so we'll, we'll put international and, and, uh, national award shows in front of them, but we'll also make up our own assignments. Of Those course. are typically three weeks long. Um, so portfolio development. I also teach a really, uh, tough class called creative video development, which is the art and somewhat science of coming up with campaignable video concepts. So, you know, my view is it's the hardest trick to turn in advertising is to generate an idea that launches not just one commercial, but could launch five, 10, or even 20. And so that's a mixed grad and undergrad class with a max cap of 18. Um, it's very tough to teach and is very tough to take. Uh, right what, now, are they, what, are, what, what are the expected outcomes of that class? Um, when you... When you come out of creative video development, the, the goal is to leave with a, an understanding of, most importantly, how to generate a big idea and what does a big idea look like. It's not a script, right? It's the seed that goes in the ground that leads to the plant that becomes a flower and then a whole field full of flowers. And that has to be the only way that that can be taught is through deconstruction. You know, we break, we break campaigns down and reverse engineer them. That's what I do in the beginning of class. And then mm -hmm. by the end of the semester, you should be able to generate a big idea, come mm -hmm. up, write and storyboard a minimum of three 30 second spots plus a 15 second cut downs against your main concept. And students have to do that um, three times. So there are three different assignments where they have to do that because there's a lot of repetition. And then some students get to self-select on the final project if they actually want to produce one of the spots from their campaign if they feel uh, gifted enough to do it. So in short, the short answer to your question is storyboarding, um, designing great storyboards, great copywriting, more, most importantly, coming up with a big idea that you, when I see two spots from your campaign, I can write the third one. I don't even need you to do it because you've right. got something that I can see is repetitive. Well, Doug, I can tell that you, this is a very forward thinking program. We don't see, we, I don't hear that a lot in most undergrad uh, advertising programs that they offer a class like that. Um, so I wanna get into what does the Boston University advertising curriculum look like? Is I'm assuming there's a major from all the detail that you've told me about your portfolio development classes, plural. So give me the overview. So <laughs> it's, it's a really great question. I mean, the, the College of Communications advertising program is, is its strength is in its breadth, B-R-E-A-D-T-H, right? Um, when students come into the College of Communication, the great thing about the program, if you come in as an undergrad, is you get exposed to all the disciplines. So you get a chance to try copywriting. You get a chance to try account management, you get a chance to get your hands on project management or strategy or research and find your strong spot, find the place where your heart beats the most. You know, when I was mm -hmm. a young, a young person trying to pick colleges, I was a creative, you know, I painted and I liked art. So I went to art school but that didn't expose me to all of the other disciplines in advertising. So the College of Communications program in the beginning gives you a broad spectrum of exposure to so many disciplines that allows you to find your path within that. Now, of course, for every strength, there's a weakness, but that's the strength of the College of Communication, you know. Um, and, you know, I call it the College of Accidental Creativity because I'm a creative. So I'm going to use it as an example. Most students come to the College of Communication knowing that they want to be in advertising, but they don't know exactly what they want to do. And then by getting exposed to something like CM417, which is Fundamentals of Creative Development, which is an, one of three electives that they they, they have three electives they have to choose from in this bucket. 
and it's mm -hmm. one of them. If they choose right. this, many of them are like, holy crap, I didn't realize this was a thing. I didn't realize you were paid for this. So they stumble upon the idea that, oh my God, I didn't realize I could make money telling jokes, making people cry, making the hair stand up on the back of their neck in 30 seconds or 15 seconds or 60 seconds. And they get excited about it. So, you know, in, in that way, we're, we're a sort of a, a field that you can, you know, plant yourself in and find a place to grow. And there's a, a lot of places to do that. And you oversee or you're, you're heavily involved. One of the professors of practice within that creative sector that you can dive deeper in, correct? Yeah. So, um, before we get into creative, then I want to know mm, what are the other ones that, so you said research per, like what, what are the other categories in your right. program that if you wanted to hone in on before right. we so get we more have, into the creative, we have, uh, instructors who are experienced in media strategy and media buying, um, creative creative strategy or brand strategy depending on what you know word you want to put on that and account management um so uh, project management all of those uh, mm -hmm. disciplines are sort of available to people there within that major and then there's you know one of the historic strengths of the program is a a course called ad lab and ad lab is a student run advertising agency with um typically 125 students every semester with nine to 10 real clients where students are put into different groups consisting of project managers, mm -hmm. account managers, um, copywriters, art directors, strategists, and, and um, researchers. And those people work in a functional team just like they do in an agency outside. Um, so it gives it gives the students this sort of real world ecosystem of oh i see why all of these positions matter and how they interact with each other and you know not only is it a positive experience it's also like a bit of a cluster and that helps them because you know i like to say, people say what's ad lab like and i say well imagine you work at an agency where every 13 weeks 80 percent of the people are new and have no idea what they're doing uh so hey, not too far off yeah some agencies nowadays <laughs> hey um is that a class or is that a extra cur so curriculum ad lab itself is a class and if you nice. like the class you get to um interview for the executive board which is the student management board who runs mm -hmm. there's an executive board of students who manage the, the class, class and, and, and advised by faculty love that we had the same thing i ran the the student club so we had about 50 members and 10 clients doug you should go in there i'm telling you right now this is something that's funny there are people that are like all in on their anticipated track i was all in on account but doug yeah. if you would have came into that club or that class and said gino you're trying out copywriting for half of the semester that would have that could have changed my whole career trajectory not saying it was copywriting but who knows or like because there, you'll have students that go i'm always account i don't care but yeah. if you you get them in that ad, ad lab i think that's a fun little challenge and just force them to to do strategy or to try out a different role and they can specialize back in later but for me i was always one track minded yeah and it, you know what's really important too is by playing a different role even in a classroom you develop empathy for yeah. the other discipline and it's hugely yeah. important in fact many of the strategists who graduate from BU what i tell them when they're going out into the world is i said look you have a very unique you have a unique position to sell yourself because you're a strategist who knows who can do research and come up with a great creative brief with a positioning statement but you've been in creative classes you know how difficult it is to come up with concepts that become ads. So therefore, when you're creating a brief, you have a level of empathy for the next person in line and you have right. their considerations in mind. That makes you better at what you do. So when you go into an interview and someone says, what makes you unique? Why should we hire you? 
You say, because I know what the next person is doing and I have empathy for them and I create my briefs with the understanding of how difficult their job is. That's a way to separate yourself. It's a great narrative and it's absolutely true. Um, and definitely specialize for your students. And I'm sure there are some listeners out there that might have another similar experience, but I love that. So back to the tracks then, or the, or the, you know, honing in on different, uh, uh, skills. So you, you got to tell me more about the creative cause that's your expertise here. Um, so I take one of the three bucketed classes that one out of three are mandatory. You're saying that are creative classes. And that's probably yeah, the foundational so, principles. Yeah. So when 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 students come into the, pro, the 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 entry level creative class is called Fundamentals of Creative Development, mm -hmm. and you'll hit that. Students typically hit that in either their sophomore or early junior years. Sure. And yeah. it's it's one of three. There are three electives. They have to take two out of the three. Okay. And when they take that one, that's the door opener. So if they walk into that class, it doesn't matter what discipline they've been in. The person who's teaching that class is going to say, okay, who's going to be an art, who wants to be an art director and who wants to be a copywriter? Because those are the nice. two roles in this class. And you can try being a writer for one project and you can flip to being a copy uh, uh, art director for another. Um, but these, these classes expose you to sort of coming up with concepts and creating them and you know generating multiple ideas and being open to critique right. and building yourself to the point where you can by the end of that semester begin to think about things in campaignable mm -hmm. form because the next step after that is portfolio development classes where it's a huge leap and those are the classes that I, my, I teach and my my colleague Pagin Ryan uh, also teaches where we Every project is three weeks. So it's three weeks, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks. It's pretty unrelenting where we break it into uh, sections. You come in with uh, a minimum of five big ideas in the first week. Then we put that work on the wall. You know, figuratively, it goes up on the screen. The class mm -hmm. interacts with it. We allow the class to speak first. I play a game called Love, Don't Love, Curious, which uh, ask students to look at the lessons. Yep. See, yep. what do I love? What do you not love? What are you curious about? And we use that to weed stuff out. And then yep. in the second week, we winnow that stuff down. And then the third week, it's new business pitch time. And this stuff is, you know, big campaignable ideas. I have a mandatory in each of my projects. So the first project, the mandatory might be, okay, three New York Times masthead banners. You know, mm -hmm. if you pay attention to digital advertising today, there's only one platform out there that gets big digital advertising. It's the New York Times and The Athletic, which the New York Times owns. If the rest of the internet would wake up uh, to the, the capacity of big digital, we would have a whole different discussion about how great digital advertising can be and how creative it can be because the size is big. So. My mandatory in, in the first project is three, uh, three New York Times digital masthead banners, but that's not the only thing you can do. You have to have that. After that, it's up to you to decide what your other deliverables right. are, which is whether that's out of home, social, video, like take your pick. Yeah, understood. How do you grade that? Uh, okay, so that's a laundry list, but the, the short we go over that in the very first week and the way we grade is um, the only way you get an A in that in this class, a straight A is it's agency ready work. In other words, I as a creative director would be like, let's go to the client with this and not like a figurative client. Like I'll take this to my real client and I would be unafraid to sell this through. So an A is you work in my agency and I love you for this. I'm I'm ready to take it to the client. And A minus is this is amazing, but it's got some some things that need to be cleaned up. A B plus is this is a great idea, but there's mistakes that are obvious and easy to spot. And then a B is there's a there's an idea there, but there's also mistakes. It's kind of on its way, and then it sort of travels down from there. Where where a B minus is there's a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily going right. Do you ever bring in outside judges? Uh or to 
to look at the work? Um, I don't, um, but other faculty members occasionally do. I don't because the course is so jam packed. Yeah, um, that that, I that's great. I love that structure. Every three weeks, uh, that something else is going on. Listen, yeah. it seems like you're you understand that these kids need a portfolio, and oh, totally. high level. Yeah. Not everybody yeah. gets that, and not every university does truly prep that. They'll have one or two portfolio classes, or, uh, and they, uh, they they struggle. They struggle to to do that. And then a lot of times the kids will graduate, and they see that they want to be a copywriter, art director, and boom, they don't have a great portfolio, or they only have one or two campaigns that are decent. So it seems like you're you have a very very high level understanding that they need five to six good campaigns that are agency ready. It shouldn't look like student work, and you understand that. Yeah, everything everything we tried, we want students to have enough room to fail. So you mm -hmm. know, when I give four projects in a semester, the the what I the message that I'm sending is it's okay if you screw one of those up. Like that's going to happen. Like so, you know, if you take portfolio and you get three great projects out of four, and then you take hey. it again and you get three out of four, you got six. Yeah, you did it. And really, people kind of get away with four or five. And yeah. And how long would you? So that would be two semesters. You know, you get four chances each semester. Is that accurate? And you get two You can get two shots. So that's eight shots. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's perfect. Plus, that's really good. Yeah. And. I think, you know, some key learnings here, like even if you're not a student at, at BU, first off, transfer, <clears throat> transfer over <laughs> there, take this, this, this program, because it seems like Doug gets it. And I, I do have to applaud you on that. I, I think that's really fantastic. Um, but also, if you're not at that a program that offers this, you got to create your own. You got to do it yourself. And yeah. or you'll have to do it and when you graduate. You have to explain to your parents, uh, not quite there at the job that I, I truly want. And we want, I want to get into that, Doug, talking about the, the right job. And then uh, you'll have to do it when you graduate or you'll have to go to portfolio school. Yeah. And, and, you know, the work never stops really. Um, you know, even, <laughs> even though like an example that I give is, you know, I, t I told one of my students this just a couple of weeks ago, I said, look, when I was coming up through the business, I wasn't, I had a job as an art director, but I wasn't getting the best work. I was working on, you know, a bank and I was punching out raid ads and I wasn't excited about what I was doing. And what we did as young creatives was we would go out. Uh, I would team up with a writer and we would go out and we'd find a client. We'd go to a small business. I went to a, a mountain bike manufacturer and then a road bike manufacturer. And I said, hey, there is a really small business, but they made great bikes. And I said, look, we're creatives in a big agency. We would love to work for you for free. Would you, yep. would you be willing to let us like have at it creatively? And if you love it, we'll make posters for you. And they'd yep. be like, yeah, yeah. And I, I was a fully functioning creative at that point. So you, yeah. you never stop wanting to make great stuff. Right. And you bring up a lot of good points here. Even when you get your first job, let's say your, your student portfolio is really great. You get hired you kind of have to sit on that student portfolio for the most part for one, two years, maybe. I mean, yeah. the agency yeah. I work at, we're very flat. You can get shots on goal here. Mm -hmm. And I, I pride my, I'm, pri I'm very proud of Havas Chicago plug or not, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of agencies where big agencies, especially they'll, they'll give the best briefs to the senior teams and you won't yeah. get a shot on goal. And then when I, what I say, by what I mean by that is you won't get an opportunity to work on a, a great brief potentially for a year. It could be coupons. It could be small digital banners. Now you're, if you're a student of Doug's, I know that you're going to take that every opportunity the best you can and make the best work possible with even the small coupon ad. I don't know if they make those anymore. They're going <laughs> to work their, their butts off because you taught them that and they're going to make it a great opportunity. But seriously, you're going to, you might have to sit on your student portfolio for a while. That's why it's so important that like in your class, Doug, when people are taking it, they need to take that seriously because they might have to ride that out for a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in my last lecture, one of the things, the first slide I put up is every ladder has a bottom rung. Get on it. Um, yeah. You know, you know, when what we're teaching you to do at, at Boston University College of Communication and many uh, creative programs are doing is. We're teaching you to be ready when your opportunity comes. Yep. The mistake that young people make is thinking that what they're doing 
at a high level in college is what their first job is going to look like. And they are decidedly rarely that. There are rare exceptions where students walk right into making great stuff. But those those are like perfect marriages. They're, they exist, but there's very few of them. Mm -hmm. You know, but what we're getting you ready for is when you get your opportunity, you know how to deal with it. You've already right. been there. And that's that's why these programs are run the way they are. And I can tell you on the agency side now, as we just got done, run, like for our internship here, we're not we're not even hiring people for the internship that can't do the work today. There's no yeah. there's not much job training at, at high level agency like you got to be able to walk in here and uh, understand the concepting process and, and, you know, the storyboarding, like you said, all those basics that's expected even for internships now um, yeah. at these bigger agencies, because then they want to convert you full time. And we've seen time and time again, not always, but we see that, you know, higher, you know, seniors are, are, are getting internships. This all depends on the economy as well, right? If we win new yeah. business and the economy is yeah. great. We're going to hire yeah. whoever we can, whenever we can, as long as they're interesting. But right now it's looking like, you know, you, you gotta be able to, to, to do this stuff right away. Yeah. It's fun. It sounds like you're really good at this. Um, so, and what's that fine. So you can do that, uh, portfolio class twice. You said there's how many classes in the creative track? So I, uh, I don't know specifically how many, but you can take, you can take, Portfolio development twice, plus you can take art direction. Which okay, is, you can specialize there. Gotcha. Yep. Um, there's advertising copywriting, which is another class that you, that people mm -hmm. can take. There's fundamentals of creative development. There's creative video development. We also have some classes in UX and UI. Sure. Um, so we so we have yeah. courses there. Yeah, man. I could tell. I'll tell you what. There's no job in demand like design and UX UI design. It's just it's yeah. needed. It's needed. Yeah. Um, understood. Okay. Let's get into your story. How did you, how did you break into advertising? Cause we talked about your teaching career. Mm -hmm. I want to understand uh, when you were young or how, however old you were at the time, what made you say, Hey, I want to, my name is Doug gold and I want to make ads. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I go back to before the computer. Um, and so I was in ninth grade and I loved art and, I was, a, uh, I was about, you know, I was going to be a first generation college student. My dad was a machinist. My mother was a homemaker. No one in my family had ever gone to college. And that's not just my nuclear family, but my extended family that I was aware of. So this was a big deal that they, my parents had a son who said, I want to go to college because I want to make money, right? That was what I wanted to do. And so they're all excited about that. But then I said, well, I want to uh, go to art school. <laughs> heck no. <laughs> And they were like panicked. So they went to my art teacher in, in ninth grade and Mr. Beal, and they had a, a after school meeting with him. And they said, you know, he wants to go to college, but he wants to study art. And, you know, what can he do to, yeah. to not be, you know, starving in an attic and cutting off his ear. Kind of cool though. Yeah. So uh, what my art teacher told them is he said, well, you know, I make, a living, you know, I, I teach art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's one path. But he said he steered my parents towards commercial art. So my parents said, use that term to me. You won't hear that today, but that's a term that yeah. was thrown around back then. I heard it. Yeah. And so my, my parents uh, steered me towards, you know, what would become advertising. And I had to go to the state college. You know, we did not have a lot of money. Um, when I moved into college, uh, true story. I had two shirts that hung on a hanger. That was it. There was never there was never a moment in my childhood where I could not close the drawer of my bureau because I had too many T-shirts in it. Um, my they always everything always opened and closed. So we didn't come from a lot. So there was a great state college at the time called, that had a design program called South, Southeastern Massachusetts University, which is now University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. They had a great okay. visual design program and I got accepted there. And um, I was a hopelessly average creative student. I'm not going to lie. It's actually one of the stories that I tell in my, in my classes. Um, I, I was, I could paint, I could sculpt. I understood how to draw, but 
concepts were design concepts were challenging for me and I was an average student. Um, but it wasn't because I wasn't trying. And I think this is a message that's really important to the people who listen to your program. The, if, if you looked at my cumulative average as a college student, everything about my grades said, this guy's going to be a middler for the rest of his life. And so why did that not happen? Why did I go on to, you know, make Super Bowl ads, win the USA Today ad meter, win a con lion? You know, why did all those things happen? Because even though my work was average, every day I tried as hard as I could. Every day for me was my best effort. Now, my best effort didn't lead to a lot of good stuff in the first 10 <laughs> years of my career. Nothing wrong with that. No, but every, that's what everybody needs to know is yeah. that it, it might not happen for you quickly, but if you want it and you keep pressing, it, it will come for you, but you have mm -hmm. to, you have to be willing to get knocked down. So, the, you know, the, the, <laughs> I wound up with an average portfolio. So let me back up for you, like sub average, I couldn't find a job. Um, so for four months, I, I built pools, which is what I did every summer in ground pools. Nice. And I interviewed for I interviewed for a job in uh, what's called what was called recruitment advertising, help wanted advertising, which is like was the lowest of the low on the totem pole of shit you could do in advertising. OK, but I knew nothing about it. So I was excited to have this opportunity. And this is a networking story. The only reason I got this job and this is the truth is because the vice president of the agency was my soccer goalie in high school's father. Oh, yeah. And, and, and my church youth group leader when I was in middle school. And he told the creative director to give me a job because I had interviewed for a job, a job with this guy three months before and he didn't hire me. So your network matters. I got my first job because... I had a network. And this sure. is the second this is the second important message. For 2 years I grounded out for garbage money, but I learned a ton. Um I worked with really good people who were mentors for me and when I had questions they answered them, but it was 60 hours a week for very short money and at the end of 2 years I was mentally spent and I wasn't sure advertising is what I wanted to do. So I quit without a job, still living in my parents' home. And I went to bartending school and tended bar for a year and loaded UPS trucks. And I think the reason I love to tell this story and what's important is I allowed myself to explore other things besides advertising because my gut told me, I'm not sure this is for me. I need to figure some stuff out. And I went on, you know, what I now call like a walkabout, like a sort of, you know, a, a journey of trying to figure out what am I all about? And I came back after that year and reset my compass and started on the long climb up the creative ladder. Um, what were your was, first steps to do that? Coming back. Mm -hmm. Oh, so what, what'd you, you change? Um, well, after spending a year attending bar, um, I looked at myself in the mirror and, you know, I was becoming part of the restaurant subculture, which was cool. Yeah. But I said, not for is you. This, Long is this what you want? You know, is this what you want? And the answer was no, I don't want this either. Maybe I need, maybe I haven't given it enough of a shot. Maybe I need to go back and try. So that's what I decided to do. I, you know, put my portfolio back together. I got a job at some podunk advertising agency in New Hampshire over a guy's garage. Um, you know, mm -hmm. five people working over his garage in a startup. Um, and what did I care? I was learning something. So mm -hmm. I was there for, you know, I was there for two years. And then I was at a small agency in Linfield for five um, where I did bigger work. And then I got my big break when I hit Hill Holiday at 32, 32 years old. So, you know, I didn't. And, and you were always an uh, art director this, this entire time. For the most part, you were trying to stay on the art director path. I was a creative. I was a creative director at Carney Moline and Company before Hill Holiday, so I was a creative director. I could write too, so I can, I can do both. Um, but I'm an art director by trade, but I have gotcha. been known to write. Um, yeah, well, so, you as you got older and you got more experience, you have to understand decent yeah. writing. You have to be able to call call it out, work on it, tweak it for sure. Yeah. 
but that's good context. I like this. And sometimes I'm even thinking like, sometimes like it, that's what it takes is you to like for all the listeners out there um, to, to break out of advertising. I've never said this. We usually we're trying to break in, but there's almost some respect that you gain when you break out of some sort of marketing discipline that you don't love. And then I see that on your resume and I have a conversation with you and I talk to the young Doug, well, what happened and what'd you do? And if you were to yeah. tell me that you went to bartending school, I, for, that's cool. To yeah. me, that's what, the, that's what recruiters want to hear. Cause, oh, why'd you go to bartending school? What'd you learn? What type of cocktail? Could you make cocktails at our holiday party? And <laughs> who'd you talk to? Well, you might've met mm -hmm. some, oh, you met some executives down in Boston. Well, are any of them looking for new business? Yes. You got a connection there. So the, the, there's, there's a lot of respect and almost adds to your resume in a unique way when you have an interesting breakout story. I and mean, if you're not in a position you love, then I can respect you for making that, that change. And now you're back on the right track. You gained knowledge, life experience. Yeah. It's almost like, yeah. I when I was a, so Gino, when I was a creative director, uh, you know, later in my career, I was interviewing a young, uh, designer fairly fresh out of school a web designer and um she had on her resume for the this most recent summer that she said i said what have you been doing this summer and she said well i'm at a i work at a summer camp and i said oh no kidding and uh i said what do you do there and she said well you know they're underprivileged kids some of them have learning disabilities and things like that and i've been there for now a few talking. years and, and i really love it and i said i said look i said i am so proud of you for not hiding from this. There are so many people who will not put tough experiences or meritable or empathetic, you know, non-career based experiences on their resume because they think it'll hurt them. What I told this woman is this is what makes you special to me. What makes you special to me is you showing me a dimension of yourself that is about empathy and caring about people. And I said, that's the quality I'm looking for. We can teach you to do anything here, but I try to hire two, one type of person. I have two people I can choose from, talented and nice and talented assholes. Those are the two kinds of people that we find because we have to have talented. Once I interview you, I'm trying to find out, are you nice? Are you not? And yeah, do we want to work with you? Yeah. Right. And this, this woman, by telling me what she was doing, was immediately establishing herself as this is a good human being. And this is who I want in the room. And she never did anything to dissuade me after working there from believing it's a, that's exactly who she was and was who she was. I hear you. I love that. And what was the moment that you, so you went on, you said you had an award-winning career at Cannes, uh, Super Bowl, an ad meter. Um, what was your, when was the decision to break back, to break into academia then? So, <laughs> um, you know, your listeners might want to hear this story and they might not want to hear the story. I was 35. I think, no, I was 32 years old, 33 years old. I was in a big agency meeting at Hill and I was looking around and uh, at this meeting and I, I didn't see anybody in their 60s. Nobody except the owner, except the guy that owned the agency. And so my friend George Getz, who was five years older than me, uh, at the end of the meeting, I said, hey, George, I had a question like, where's all the old people? And he's like, oh, you, you don't know? And I said, I don't know what. And he says, no one ever retires from an advertising agency. He said, unless you own it. And I said, yep. okay. He said, I said, okay, good to know. So I had, from then on, I had two relative paths. One was to become a partner, which was a possibility for me as I moved up in my career. The other was to find something else that I could do. Um, mm -hmm. So ultimately, what I what I decided when I became senior vice president, a group creative director, was I got so close to the mechanisms of power, I didn't want them. I didn't. There was I didn't get to be creative anymore. I would be going to too many dinners. I'd be glad handing people. So, in other words, for me to stay to the end was meant doing things that weren't in alignment with who I was as a person, right? Sure. So I decided 
I need to find something else. And there was, it was an accident that somebody reached out to me about teaching adjunct, which is part-time mm-hmm. faculty in my fifties. And they said, uh, someone said, you should talk to this guy. B was looking for an adjunct. And they said, talk to this guy. He's great with young people. And that's, that's how it happened. And I taught adjunct for four and a half years. And then it was getting to be the best part of my day because uh, I was energized by young people and the the hunger that they had. They're like sponges. Uh, they ask great questions. And then they say thank you at the end of the day, which is, you know, you, you get to do the good the good human thing, which is great. You know? So you so you did adjunct for four years and you converted to uh, full time. Yeah. So I've been teaching full time for six years. Yeah. Great. Final piece of yeah. advice that you have for our listeners, Doug, you want to get out there. Yeah. So. Um, This is a, if you imagine in your heads, um, this is something I've developed in the last year and a half, but it's, it's based on, you know, almost 40 years in the business and trying to help people define what they, what's right for them. Right. So imagine a target in your head. Okay. Um, There's a bullseye. There's a ring around that bullseye. There's another ring. And then there's the outside of the ring, very much like the target logo. If you want to sort of imagine that in your head. In the middle, you write the two words, I want, okay? And I want represents exactly the most perfect job you could possibly get, okay? Big agency, if it's a big agency, small if it's small, startup if it's a startup, right? In-house if it's in-house, whatever your most perfect job is, where that job is, and what you would be doing and the clients you would be working on. That's your I want, okay? The next ring out is I will, okay? I mean, I, is yeah, is I will, right? Which is, these are things that are slightly outside of there that you'd be more than happy to do, but it isn't your perfect job, but you certainly would do it, okay? Then the third ring out is I can, okay? This, these are the jobs that you take when you can't get those two inner rings and you need income. And then the last... The outside the bullseye is I won't. And you have to write down the things that you do not want to do. Like I don't want to work on, for instance, pharmaceutical advertising, if that's your thing. Or I don't want to work at a startup if that's what you don't want to do. And what you do is you create this list. And then wow. when you start, when you go out looking for jobs, you actually access this list and see where it fits on your scale. Because we as humans make the mistake of thinking we can keep it all in our heads. We can't. And we're all individuals. There's no job in advertising that is perfect for everybody. And many people make the mistake of thinking that their best friend at school and they are the same person. They're not the same person and they won't necessarily respond to the same stimulus. Right. So you have to decide who you are. And then the last piece of this is, this is the other thing I say to people all the time about advertising, is a common mistake to buy labels, right? Advertising is a label-driven business. We wear shirts with logos, pants with logos, and sneakers with logos. We buy logos. Right now, Mischief is one of the biggest agencies in the country, like hottest agencies in the country. Great place to work, right? But what what if that's not right for you? What if, what if, let's, let's just, Let's just say, let's take mischief off the table because I don't want to make it seem like I'm pointing fingers because it's a great agency. But let's say it's an A-list agency, okay? Let's let's say BBDO New York, okay? You get a job offer there, but you're you're working on the worst client with the shittiest boss, okay? You made a mistake because you bought a label. When you go looking for a job, you should care about two things. What's my opportunity? Who's my boss? Over the course of my career, the happiest moments in my career, those two things were always right. It was never where my office faced, what whether it was easy to get to, how big the building was, or what the name was on the door. It was what was I working on every morning when I yep. came into work and who was looking out for me. And it changes all the time. Changes yeah. all the time. You have to be smart. Yeah. You got to know. You got to do your research. You got to ask. You got to see who's winning new business, what business, who's creative director, who's the new president. That's right. It's always moving. These labels remain the same, but the environments change. Uh, right. 
I love you said it perfectly. And I say that every time I have students come into Havas, I go, don't look every, every agency, every agency has got a ping pong table. Don't choose it off the ping pong table. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's about who you work with and what you're working on. So Doug, this that's is perfect. Right. How can people reach yeah. out to you? You have a wealth of knowledge. I want to make sure that we can connect you to the right people. If they have any other further questions, what's the best way to do so? Yeah. So, so the best way to do it is to shoot me an email at uh, G O U L D D at B U dot E D U, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Perfect. I'm easy, easy enough to find if somebody we'll wants that. to, yep. They can reference, you know, they can reference the podcast here and I'll be happy to, you know, set up a zoom or talk to them. Wonderful job, Doug. Thank you so much for coming on. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks for having me, Gino. Of course.